welcome everyone to this excellent presentation today. I am going to give you a brief explanation about what's going on with this one. I'm proud to announce that this week we are touring, touring in quotations, with the Library of Congress Labs team. The tour will be broken into two 30-minute sessions with two, as I like to say, amazing employees who I happen to have worked with and known in person as well. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you curious about technology and innovation beyond the makerspace, this tour is for you. So a little bit about what we're listening to during this next hour. Um, we're listening about how and learning about how the Library of Congress labs support digital transformation at the largest library in the world. For the first part of the tour, Senior Innovation Specialist Jamie Mears will share experiments on labs.loc.gov and answer a question about the labs team and their work. For the second part of the tour, Senior Innovation Specialist Lauren Algie will discuss labs crowdsourcing program by the people, which if you haven't used is pretty amazing. And same with Jamie's things as well, which encourages virtual volunteers to engage with the papers of figures from history such as Walt Whitman, Clara Barton, Alan Lomax. So a little bit about our presenters. Jamie Mears works at the Library of Congress Labs team. She supports labs experiments with digital collections, ran the Congressional Data Challenge, and supports the library's Innovator in Residence program. Before this, she was a national digital stewardship resident and worked with her co-presenter Lauren to build the Memory Lab, a personal archiving station and program at DC Public Libraries. Lauren Algy is a member of the Library of Congress Labs team and a community manager for By the People, an open source crowdsourcing platform and program that invites the public to help improve the discovery of the library's digital collections. She formerly led digital projects for DC Public Library Special Collections, where she also worked to establish the Memory, Memory Lab Network and DC Punk Archive. She's interested in how libraries are using technology to democratize our collections and services while grappling with issues of security and privacy. So with that, I hand off the speakership to Jamie. And as I said in here, if you have questions, please ask them in the um, chat section and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. And as our, if our presenters are open to also hearing questions from the crowd, we'll leave it open so you can unmute your microphone and come online if you'd like. All right, go ahead, Jamie. So hi, everybody. Um, I hope that this is really interactive. Um, I was really excited when Erica reached out because we used to work together um, at DCPL when I worked with another lab and now I've like come to a different lab at the Library of Congress, um, which is a, a lot different. Um, and I also want to say that um, I apologize for anyone who thought they were getting a tour of a physical lab at the library. Although the library is, is very, very beautiful, where I work is um, a cubicle office space, just like probably most bureaucrats in DC. Um, so it's not very special, although I can go across the street sometimes to like see actual rare books and things, which is a pretty great perk of the job. Um, so the tour that I'm gonna be giving in this first part is mostly on our labs.log.gov website, but I'm also happy to, I'll be showing you all a bunch of things that I hope um, are exciting and help explain our work. But I'm also just really curious if anyone has questions about digital strategy or digital transformation or how labs can forward technical innovation in cultural heritage spaces. Um, so the plan is that I'll present for about 20 minutes and then I'm hoping that we'll be able to have a conversation, a more interactive conversation for 10. Um, and if it doesn't turn out that way, then I'll continue to talk about more things. And then my colleague, uh, Lauren Algy is going to hop on at three o'clock to talk specifically about our crowdsourcing program at the library. Does that sound good? Okay, great. So, um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I think that this is the best place to start um, to give you all some background on our lab. So our lab was created in 2016 and uh, we're called LC Labs and um, we were organized under 
we'd existed for about a year and a half, and then we were quickly organized under a, a digital strategy directorate at the Library of Congress. Although the work we were doing from the beginning, I would say, was always um, related to digital strategy, but formally we were organized in the digital strategy directorate. And the reason why that matters is because um, it really scopes our work in our organizational context. So the Library of Congress is um, the largest library in the world. About 3,000 employees work here. Um, digital transformation happens all around the library every single day. But the idea of what our team does is essentially we, we helped write and publish a digital strategy for the library that came out last year. And our goal is to essentially kind of very purposefully track digital transformation happening at the library. And that work manifests in a bunch of different ways, and I think it's easier to show them than to talk about them, so that's what I'll spend most of the time doing. But just to give you a sense of our digital strategy, we basically have three main goals. We want to throw open the treasure chest of the library. So um, the library has been working for decades to digitize our materials and put them up online for access within copyright, but there is a lot of potential, especially when you think about um, ways that collections could be used computationally or within applications, creative ways um, that we still haven't totally tapped yet. So we want to throw open the treasure chest. We want to connect to um, a broader um, audience of users beyond traditional, what you might call scholars. And we also want to invest in the future of the Library of Congress, which is why we're always paying careful attention to emerging technologies on the market and exploring if they um, would be useful in our organizational context. So if you're curious about reading the strategy, it's not very long. And I think we did a really nice job, I think, of um, putting it in like normal human voice. <laughs> so if you are curious about reading that um, or you yourselves are thinking about writing a digital strategy for your organization, then I encourage you to go to lsd.gov slash digital strategy. So now for the rest of the tour, I'm gonna spend it on our homepage. So we have a site called labs.lock.gov. And the reason why that is really important and the reason why we're not like a subset page off of lsd.gov is because we're a sandbox for experimentation for the entire Library of Congress. So that's important for a lot of reasons, right? Like we can experiment here, test applications, and then if they become something that gets permanent by, and then you would, you know, eventually see it on lock.gov. So this was a really, being able to have this website for library employees and collaborators to experiment was a really big win for us. Um, so for uh, this make her session, I do want to share that um, most of our team is all female. We have one colleague who's non-gender identifying. And that has been like, everyone says that that's really unique, that um, there are, this is like a very unique makeup for a tech team. And we agree, we don't meet very many other teams that have our same uh, lineup. And I, it's been really quite a privilege to be able to work with all of these fabulous people, including my colleague Lauren, who you'll meet soon. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my boss. Uh, the director of digital strategy is Kate Sward. Um, please follow her on Twitter if you can. Um, I think she's beta Kate. I need to look up her Twitter handle. But if you are curious about what it's like to be the director of digital strategy for the largest library in the world, um, it's a really interesting Twitter account to follow. And she's been um, a very innovative leader and a champion uh, for us in the majority female team at the library. So let's talk about some cool things that we do. Um, so when we talk about emerging technologies, one of the things that's on our mind right now, there's a couple of things that pop up. One of them is this idea of collections as data. So I don't know how familiar people are with that, but we're really interested in being able to support researchers who don't wanna use our items item by item by item, right? So anyone who's doing network analysis or data visualization or text mining, those types of computational um, uh, research methodologies are something that we are really interested in supporting because we have so much data. So we feel like it's a great way to utilize it. And we have a series of experiments under our experiments page that try to show in a kind of prototypey way what this research um, could look like. 
So I'll show you a couple of examples. This first one here is Library of Congress colors. So the Library of Congress has a public API um, and I will, I'll show you um, in the next bit um, some of the tutorials that we have online to teach you how to use it, but it, which essentially means that you can query the entire Library of Congress's website and ask questions and get back um, a data set-esque result. So when we first started talking about the API, uh, sharing it, you know, broadly and publicly, there were a lot of questions about what the potential of that could be. Like, what could you do with an API that's different from just using items um, singularly? So we worked with a collaborator named Laura Rubel, who did, she is a digital um, scholarship librarian at uh, George Washington University. And she did her sabbatical with us and was really interested in focusing on um, API techniques and prototyping apps for that type of technology. So this was one she did called Library of Colors. And here you can see there's a list of collections that we have here at the library. So we have baseball cards, cartoons and drawings, Civil War maps. And if you click on any of these, what you see is this really interesting palette that essentially visualizes the collection as a color palette. And each one of these palettes, if you click on it, represents one item. So there's a tutorial that goes along with this on the page. If you wanna do it yourself or you wanna apply them to your own collections, there's a Jupyter notebook to do that. Um, but essentially uh, the point of this was to show basically a very, very abstract way of using our collections um, that tapped a potential that was um, not characteristic for the types of ways that people were used to interacting with our items. Um, for those of you who are um, sewers, knitters, uh, et cetera, Laura actually made one of these collections. She made a, uh, pr she printed it onto material and she sewed handbags. I think it's this one. Yes, it's this one, because it's really. So this is actually a, like, she, that she had printed and she made everyone on our team handbags as a parting gift, which is kind of bizarre because um, she was giving us a gift when she was leaving and not the other way around. But um, if anyone was interested in doing that, it's, it's really beautiful. And we use this a lot now on a lot of our marketing because it's just so eye grabbing. So speaking of thinking about um, emerging technologies, APIs, different ways of access, there is another take on exploring the library by color that I wanted to show. So to give a little, a little bit of context for this, our team recognized pretty quickly that there were a lot of very, very creative and innovative minds um, working in the broader field, even outside of a cultural heritage context that we wanted to invite here to see what they would do if they took their unique perspective and did some type of research project or some type of production project at the library. And what that position ended up being called is Innovator in Residence. So it's a program where we accept um, one to several innovators every single year. Um, it's mostly remote. They're only required to be on site two days out of the month. Um, and they essentially make a proposal of something um, very, very forward thinking that they wanna do. And the first innovator in residence that we had was a data artist. His name is Jer Thorpe. And he was very prolific while he was here. Um, he created a podcast called Artists in the Archive that um, I suggest you all listen to if you're curious about um, getting into like the nerdy weeds of how the library works, how we process our collections, really interesting stories about some items that we have here. But he also did a series of applications where he was testing the idea of bringing serendipity back to large scale libraries. So what that means, and I'd be curious if anybody, if this resonates with anyone else, at the public library, for example, because there's open stacks, um, you can browse, right? So you could go and look for a book that's about gems, but then you would find something on greenhouse gases, right? Or something like that. Like you, you end up stumbling upon topics that you weren't even in search of in the first place. And that's really hard to do at a, at a place like the Library of Congress because the stacks are closed. So, or because the search is, you know, architected in a way that you, know, you need to come in with a specific question. So he created a series of apps to explore what would it be like if 
our correct our collections were in a form where you could kind of just serendipitously surf through them. And one example of that is this one here, Library of Time. So he built these on Glitch, by the way, if anyone's used the Glitch app. So all of these are open source and they're available to remix. So what you're looking at here is actually the time, the current time right now. It is 2.50 and 27 seconds. And what he's doing is he's pulling descriptions or titles from our collections. And if they're hyperlinked, then you can click on them and it will take you to the item. So it's, um, it's a very, what you would say, a, a very passive way of basically finding some type of entry point into the collection. Another thing that you can see from looking at our data this way is that we have a lot of non-English um, items in our collection, which a lot of people don't realize, but it's, they really come into focus when you see them through this application. So now the clock just started over because it's 251. And we have so many items that essentially this clock can run for, for eternity. That's the idea. And that you would like never repeat the same item ever again. So this was a proof of concept essentially to test this idea of serendipity. He also did color, but he came at it from a very different perspective than Laura Rubel, um, which I think is interesting. We're trying to get our collections into a place where we can have a bunch of different interpretations. You know what I mean? Like every single app, I think only adds to access points into the library. So we really liked this dialogue that kind of appeared between Jer's work on colors and Laura's work. So to explain a little bit about what you're seeing here, this application also built on Glitch um, shows collections, again, like, like Laura's. So you can browse, visuals are, is our photograph collection, US literature, music, and maps. And if you click on them, you'll see that the color spectrum changes. So what he's visualizing here is he's taking the titles or descriptions of let's say all of our books that we have in our holdings of US literature, and he is mapping their color words to a color spectrum. So these are all fairly obvious because black is a very popular word in the English language. But here, for example, you can see midnight is actually a color word. So he's used that to map it to a spectrum. And with this one as well, if you click on a, I'll go back to the, um, our photographs collection because it's really pretty. Um, if you click on some of these, then you can return to the original item. So again, it's just like a, a, a passive way of finding entry into our collections and hopefully it expire, inspires you to, um, to explore further. So let me back up a little bit. Um, just for the interest of time, uh, I will give a little bit of an overview of some of the other things that um, you can explore on the site. And then I wanna go into some of the tutorials that we've made available for members of the public to um, teach a little bit of basic code and basically entry level API to um, encourage people to use our collections at scale. So you're going to hear all about the By the People program from Lauren um, in about 10 minutes. Lauren is waving at me. Um, but I wanted to call your attention to a couple more things. So here, um, we like to do data challenges. Um, we don't give that much money away. We don't have a very big budget. But a couple thousand dollars, it really does encourage people to invest the time um, in coming up with an idea. So we want to continue to do data challenges, you know, every year for the foreseeable future because we really like um, the opportunity that it allows us to interact with the public. So this one that we did, um, we actually published the data challenge and the idea was that there would be a $5,000 first prize and a $1,000 high school prize for people to build applications on top of our website congress.gov. So if you aren't familiar with congress.gov, um, the Library of Congress supports this program where basically all of the bills and legislation, um, it's um, everyone who's a citizen of the United States is um, supposed to see those uh, in a timely manner. And so we publish them all in data sets that are open source on congress.gov. Um, and so we wanted to see if uh, coders could build applications on top of it to maybe make those data sets a little bit more user friendly for people um, that didn't have coding skills. So someone ended up making an app where essentially you can um, 
where you can look at all of the treaties that have ever been signed and start to see patterns of topics that we've signed treaties for, countries that we've signed treaties with. It's a huge data visualization. Um, and someone also made uh, an app where you can search for a member of Congress and then see um, if they're the, um, the types of subjects that they advocate for are aligned with what you, um, you yourself might be aligned with as a voter. Um, one thing that I wanted to say about this is that surprisingly at the end of this challenge, we actually had two high school students win the first prize solution as well, although there were many adults that competed in the data challenge. And that was really nice because I think that it really expanded who we think of as our users as the LC Labs team. We are usually, usually thinking about um, adults, honestly. Um, and uh, because of the types of things that we're doing with code, it became very clear that there is a huge swath of, of high schools, um, people in the high school demographic that um, probably are using our tools all the time that we didn't really have in mind. So that was an interesting turnout for this challenge. Um, okay, I'm rapidly running out of time. I encourage you to explore all of this. And even if you want, if you just um, do one thing as a takeaway, you should download our Freedies browser extension. You have to run it on Chrome. Um, uh, what's the term for when you're uh, in developer mode? You have to run it in developer mode on Chrome, which isn't very convenient. But if you download it, then every time you open a new tab, it'll pull a public domain image from our collections. And it pulls from a group of about, I think we've got like 16,000 loaded up there. So I haven't had any repeat yet. And if you find an image that you love, you can easily share it on social media or you can click into the image and read more about it on our website. It's just a really fun way to kind of always have history present in your workspace. So I thought this was a really lovely app. And, um, we um, developed this um, in partnership with our um, colleagues in the Office of Communications. So we very, very frequently collaborate with divisions outside um, of ourselves. In fact, I would say the majority of the time uh, we have a collaborator that's either from the outside of the library or from a different working part of the library. And I will finish um, with this. So LC for Robots is um, kind of how our website got started. We realized that there wasn't a single space to point to where all of our data, like bulk data actually is all over our website. Nor did we find a lot of, in, like the, we have several APIs for the Library of Congress, but the information about them was kind of spread out on different program pages. So we use this page to centralize them and another cool thing about it is that we've started um, creating Jupyter notebooks, which if you haven't used before, I highly, highly encourage it for people working in libraries. It's a lovely um, solution for trying to walk through a coding tutorial with someone because you can query live and you can also write in annotations that are plain language that anyone can understand. So to show you what I'm talking about, I'll share one example. This is a Jupyter notebook for accessing images from the Library of Congress's website. So it walks you through some really important information about rights and access, about how we make our image sizes, you know, what image sizes are available, and where you can find information about the collections. And then it basically teaches you how, so for each of these, this box, if you're connected in um, to a server, you can query this request live and you can also tweak some things to it. So if you want to look for a different example of images than baseball cards, which is what this tutorial is about, you can tweak the URL to Japanese woodblock prints or something and get that back instead. So it's, I think it's really, um, it's fun for people who um, are like Erica, I know, and others that, um, you know, you want to explore, like you want something where you like make a change and then you like get something back that's a little bit more um, material, the Jupyter Notebooks are really great for that. So anyway, it's just showing you here that they're retrieving all the URLs for baseball card images that we have. And then essentially, if you go through the code, you end up extracting rights information, which is important. And then it starts downloading items to a directory that you've set up. So by the time you're done, you have a folder with all of our baseball cards inside uh, for you to use for creative projects. So uh, that was a lot. It's always really hard to talk about our work because it's very wide 
um, ranging. <laughs> but I thought for the purposes of this audience, I wanted to focus on some of the experiment work that we've done to support the digital strategy and, and questions, any questions before Lauren talks about our crowdsourcing program. I don't have anything in the chat yet. I'm waiting to see if anybody types anything there or if anyone wants to come online and ask anything. You're more I also just have a general there. question, which is like, yeah. is my presentation at all like others that have happened or is just- Yeah, like, it is. We're weird. No, it's not <laughs> weird because like, for example, we've had people give slide presentations um, based on the technology. And when we're talking about maker spaces, some of this, the tools and technology we're working with it goes just beyond physical tools. We're talking about virtual reality. Um, we're talking about how to bring the community into the spaces that we're working in. So Great. We build things like robots and code and all of that. <laughs> so oh, this is not. not I do have. Um, I do have a shout out. I I wrote this on my notes and then I forgot because I was just because um, I'm presenting and it's hard to think at the same time. Um, yeah. We are doing a 3D capture pilot in the month of October, which we are going to heavily promote on our Twitter handle, which is um, LC underscore labs. So we're capturing 10 items. Um, it'll be the like we're doing the training. This will be the first time that we've ever done it. We have to show up with DSLR cameras and we're doing a training. Um, and we're going to be capturing things such as Abraham Lincoln's a cast of Abraham Lincoln's hands. Um, we're doing Woodrow Wilson's, I mean, not Woodrow Wilson, uh, Walt Whitman's walking stick, um, stuff like that. So they're going to be kind of far ranging. And we were going to make, we're going to make those available as an experiment on this page that I'm at right now. So awesome. some of them will be 3D printable, but then based on the affordances of the item, some of them will only be, you know, you'll only be able to screen render them. Yeah. But either way, you'll be able to download all the objects for free. Um, with the readme's and if you do anything with it we're trying to get people to tweet at us to show what they did or if they remixed anything so that's, that's the, the month of October and I do have a question in here now too so we'll go to that while we okay. have time so this is from Amy she said this all is amazing as her comment um, do you have any suggestions for how to set up an innovator in residence program it seems like that fuels a lot of ideas for you all yes uh, I do. Um, I'm not sure how like sharing links works, but I think that, um, so we have an announcement up on a federal, on a site called FedBizOps, which is how like the federal government um, puts out searches for contracts. Um, it's very like boring bureaucratic thing to say, but essentially that document that we wrote with our contracts team represents a lot of things that we've learned for how to make this program successful. Um, so one thing we've learned, for example, is to be as flexible as possible. Um, so we require when artists um, or anyone who's applying to be an innovator in residence, we require that we retain the intellectual property because we want whatever people create to be in the public domain because that meets our mission. Um, so that's not the way that a lot of creatives work, right? Like you would want to retain your IP. So because of that, we really do as much as we can to bring artists into our space and to make this a worthwhile experience for them. So whether that's behind the scenes tours um, or, uh, well, I mean, it's a lot of behind the scenes tours, but you know, working, um, the Library of Congress curators are some of the most amazing people uh, that you'll ever meet and some of the most amazing storytellers and that kind of investment for an innovator for a year is a, kind of a once in a lifetime experience. So um, we knew that that was our value and that could draw talented people to us and we always capitalize on that to keep the program going. Um, another thing is that we very, very deeply understand the constraints on staff's time and the uh, technological constraints here at the library. So we really try to work with applicants to make sure that we've come up with a project that's feasible, that supports our goals and also theirs. So I think just being flexible and making sure that everyone um, starts a project with something that can be done in a year, for example, is a great first step because I've heard a lot of um, I wouldn't call them nightmares, but there's just a lot of examples of um, creative residencies where, you know, it just, it doesn't work out and, and people are left unhappy because they can't truly realize their vision, et cetera. 
So we do a lot of work in the beginning as they're readying their project to help make sure it's something that everybody's happy with. So those are just some tips, I guess. She says, thank, this is all incredibly great information. <laughs> thank you. Another thing I'll say that we don't do well that we're going to work on, and I don't know how well anybody listening to the call does, but um, we don't do as, as good of a job as like in the moment promoting the innovators work like as they're developing it. Usually there's a lot of hype in the beginning and a lot of hype at the end. So we're about to announce our next innovator in residence probably next week. And we really want to do a better job of having people following Twitter, for example, or any kind of social media outlet, see what it's like to be an innovator here for the span of the entire project. Because there's a lot of really cool stuff that happens that you just don't get to see. So we're gonna do a better job of that. Awesome, cool. I guess I'll ask a question. So it seems like you all have a pretty incredible team. I'm curious about, and a lot of, um, so I work in IT in, in, in technology and innovation. So that's kind of handy for us. And I happen to be located in a library, which is also handy even though I work in IT. But how do you draw the sort of knowledge and how do you find resources to be forward thinking in the world of a library, mm -hmm. um, in the context of a library? And then um, how do you attain buy-in to move forward with digital strategy at your institution? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give some examples to answer your question. So, um, what we found actually for to, to answer both of those needs um, is to topically focus attention. And what I mean by that is that when we started, we started doing these once a year summits called Collections as Data. And we knew that we didn't have a totally representative, you know, in-house expertise for that. There are a lot of people here that um, work with collections at scale. I mean, it's, it's a huge institution, but, um, we invited people from um, all over the country basically to come and speak through different frames about using collections at scale. And we live streamed it. And um, at the same time that that was happening, there were a lot of staff here who maybe um, hadn't been exposed to that before that also came. So it did the dual purpose of bringing outside expertise in for us to meet and, and collaborate with directly and also kind of elevating that topic organizationally where I mean there's always competing things happening here because there's so many um, parts to the library it's like one complex machine with like lots of different goals so those summits really helped elevate and we're continuing to do that because it works for us so we just had a machine learning summit on Friday um, machine learning has been a topical focus for us for the summer and we um, did two machine learning pilots simultaneously and you'll hear about one uh, when Lauren talks, maybe if people are interested in it. Um, so we did these experiments during the summer and then we had the summit, which was again, the same model. It was like inviting people from all over that we'd secretly like fangirled out about from afar to come here and collaborate together and we'll produce a report from that. So this type of um, kind of annual, very, very topically focused thing, it helps us not spin out, I guess, in a bunch of different directions because there's so many things to constantly be thinking about and um, new innovations that are happening in the library community. So I think that this focus really helps us. Um, and as well as um, having some type of um, very op optically raised um, meeting of experts has been something that uh, politically and even like for our own knowledge has been really, really beneficial. So we'll continue to do that. We're hoping that every year we have some type of topically focused summit. And then the other thing about it too is that you make connections and then the summit's over, but then you have like all of these ideas with potential collaborators. So it, that kind of like takes you through the next year. Um, so it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving, I think, in my opinion. Excellent. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna now turn this over. And by that, I mean, Lauren is gonna just sit in my seat Wheel myself <laughs> into the frame. Sure. <laughs> um, hi. Um, Hello. So this screen is sh yeah, kind of yeah. shared right now. Okay. Um, so I'm Lauren Algy, and I'm one of the community man managers, one of the three full time staff members who works on crowdsourcing here at the Library of Congress. Um, so I'm going to show you by the people, which Jamie briefly alluded to, I think. 
um, and talk a little bit about what I think might be interesting about it from your perspective in terms of it being a innovation project here at the library and um, just a really new thing for us here. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to remember like which screen I'm driving on. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, you can find it via, via the experiments page. Um, you can also just go to crowd.lsc.gov. So uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the term crowdsourcing. So um, crowdsourcing and cultural heritage has been going on for a little while. So we're definitely not um, the first to jump into this, but that's actually pretty fantastic because it means we've learned, been able to learn a lot from organizations like the Smithsonian and National Archives um, about how to invite the public into our collections. So that's actually the first goal of this project is that it's an engagement project. It's a new way for people to encounter Library of Congress collections and um, contribute back to them. So um, our boss, Kate Zward, likes to say that that's actually the best way to let people know that they're welcome somewhere is to give them a job to do. She comes from a big Italian family. Um, so I think that that's also really true with this project that, you know, we're showing people, you know, outside of just, you know, fancy scholars that you can be a part of the Library of Congress and we, we need your help to contribute to our collections to make them more um, available to everyone. So it's primarily a transcription project. Um, I'll just jump right into the interface to show you what this looks like. Um, so you can see this is an item from the Alan Lomax collection and uh, we're inviting the public to transcribe and tag Library of Congress collections and this is to make them more searchable. So this becomes a, a just a text file that is then integrated into our digital collections and I can show you what that looks like. Um, it also makes them more accessible. That text then becomes something that someone with a screen reader can use, for example, um, for people with cognitive differences, people who just can't read handwriting can use this text. Um, and it also makes it a, a computational. So we also, um, on the lab site, actually you can see that we package up completed projects um, and, put them here as data sets. So we've done this with our first completed data set um, for the Branch Rickey campaign that we had. Branch Rickey was a baseball scout, so these are his um, really cutting and snarky uh, scouting reports, which are pretty fun. Uh, they were completed in just four months, um, 2,000 pages. So we packaged those up as, as a um, data set, the text files with a readme, and we're gonna continue to do that with the rest of our collections. Um, so that then becomes a, a body of text that scholars can use for analysis. It can then be used to build uh, projects like those that Jamie was showing off. Um, and we wrote a blog post that you can find here about some playing around we did in the data to sort of show off what you can do with this. Um, but uh, so to go back to our interface, um, this is a platform called Concordia that we built here at the library. It's the first project that we know to be built in house open source from the very beginning. We've uh, built a lot of things here that we've then released as open source. This is the first time we've built it. Um, if you go to uh, Library of Congress's GitHub, um, you can find us there. Oh, I think I just maybe started a video. Um, let's see, GitHub. We can still see everything, so it's okay. Okay, great. <laughs> um, you can find the source code there. We've actually seen um, a fair amount of interest from library community in this platform and reusing it, which is fantastic. And we know of at least one private project that is actively using it to transcribe like a personal archival collection. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, oh, now you're just getting me from two angles. I think that's what the video did. Um, <laughs> Three dimensional. Um, so, we launched with uh, five different collections and we now have, I think about 11 that we've added. Uh, we also grouped some together. Um, so we have the suffrage campaign where we've put the uh, papers of five different women suffrage leaders under the same umbrella to drive people um, to the site. So um, this is a new way for people to connect to our collections as I mentioned. Um, it's a new way for them to engage with history. We generally have tried to tie to other things that are going on and we can, for example, the Women's Suffrage Centennial. Um, we have a Walt Whitman campaign that we launched in April um, for his bicentennial of his birth that was in uh, May. Um, and we're getting ready to launch um, a campaign of Rosa Parks papers in December that'll coincide with an exhibit on her happening here at the library. Um, 
we have seen a lot of interest in this from, you know, the people you might think, retirees, lifelong learners, but also um, schools, um, libraries have really shown interest in um, bringing this back into their communities. Um, we piloted what we call a transcribathon with the DC Public Library here in town around Mary Church Terrell, um, who is a women's suffrage uh, activist and civil rights activist, just an incredible person. Also, it's her birthday today. If you don't know about Mary Church Terrell, this is a great day to find out um, more about her. But um, which she lived in DC for most of her life, so we were able to tie it back to the public library's um, own collections and to the wider DC community and local history. Um, and from that, we documented everything we did and what we thought worked well. And so now there's how to host a transcribathon um, instructions here that are borrowed heavily from Wikipedia <laughs> and the idea of Wikipedia edit-a-thons. Um, so we've also created a for educators page um, with ideas of how to bring this back into the classroom and I've seen um, a lot of interest in that from everywhere from the middle school up through university level um, of integrating this into courses um, and also into sort of like free study like school library time. Um, so this is a new thing for the library to sort of give up um, sort of this idea that the library is the only, authority, only authoritative voice and also that the public also has a lot of knowledge and energy that they can contribute to what we know about our collections. Um, and this has been a new thing for us to introduce. I'm sure Jamie talked about culture change. Um, this is a culture change for sure for the library, but it's a really exciting one. Um, as I mentioned, we're also doing tagging, which um, is purely experimental at this point. Um, so let me see if I can find something with some tags. We introduced tags um, as an experiment basically because uh, right now in the library's collection site, there would be nowhere really to put these tags. And so we're curious how people will use them, just sort of given free reign. And from there, perhaps we'll make an argument about um, how we could better direct uh, public um, attention on tagging and, and what we could sort of get out of it. Uh, but it's interesting, you'll see that they pull in a lot of proper names, but sometimes um, volunteers will also use it as a way to sort of signal to each other about um, what they see on the page. Um, if there's errors in the original spelling of names, they can use the tags to put the correct spelling of names and then try to describe it as it was written in the text, um, saying if something is in a different language, if in non-English language, um, to draw other volunteers there um, is another thing we've seen. Um, and that brings me to the fact that, so um, this is a consensus-based project. Um, some projects use um, sort of digital comparison of many transcriptions to, to get to a sort of correct and final version. We use more of a almost Wikipedia model of consensus building where it takes at least one person to take a first pass at transcribing something. Um, so I transcribe something and then I submit for review and then one other volunteer um, will have to come along and say either yes, this is correct and it's completed, or they can say this needs a few changes and they can make edits. So it could take as few as two of us to complete something that could take, you know, a dozen for something that's really complicated. Um, and we don't require volunteers to have an account to transcribe because we want to be as welcoming and as open as possible, but we do um, require that people register in order to be able to, to review and to tag. And when you register, you also get the bonus of then having like a profile page to track what you're doing. Um, we have found that, you know, there's a community of practice, um, being created around this project, um, which is really fantastic. We have a discussion forum on a site called History Hub that's hosted by the National Archives, um, where volunteers can essentially ask questions in public and we moderate these questions and we may jump in and answer them, but at this point they really also, um, respond to each other's, um, questions. This is something I posted just yesterday and then several volunteers jumping in to sort of talk to each other about um, how they could review this German, uh, the German pages that they've come across. So it's really fantastic to see um, the community really build. Um, and it also, you know, doing reference in this way in public, what we consider sort of traditional library reference, also cuts down on our need to answer a million emails. You know, they can sort of see what other people are asking and, and find answers um, themselves uh, to a certain extent. So, um, like I've been talking a lot very quickly um, <laughs> but uh, 
I, I'm sure there's like a few area avenues of this project that um, are of interest. So I'm happy to talk more based on what you've heard that sort of piques your interest um, or any questions that you're having. Let's see, nobody has typed any questions in. Um, I guess one of my questions I'll bring while I look and, and anyone's welcome to turn off their mic and ask questions or type anything in the chat. Uh, how do you determine what papers, what documents you are putting into this um, yeah. shared resource? Yeah, there's so much to choose from here. Um, so we have a few basic requirements that went on down a little bit, which is that it has to be something that's already digitized and already available on lsu.gov, which is our main website. Um, I can actually show you that. And as I do, I can show you what this looks like when it comes back into lsu.gov. Um, it has to have uh, be free of rights restrictions um, or any um, sort of screen for sensitive materials. For example, we were considering for a while a um, collection of the Sigmund Freud interviews and we realized there actually may be some sensitive things in there where people didn't really sign release you know they weren't expecting that these materials would be getting full text search available um, and uh, yeah finally it has to yeah be on lsu.gov um, because that's how we import materials our platform is built so that it ingests off of the lsu.gov API um, so it has to some things are digitized but not um, on our site yet so those are the first, first passes. And then there's a proposal process that basically follows the same way that things are considered for digitization here at the library. Um, as you can imagine, you know, we're somewhat resource constrained. There's lots and lots of things that could be digitized or that could be crowdsourced. Um, so there's sort of a committee that looks at those things and decides, yes, this is um, good for this platform and this is worth putting resources into um, and weighs that against all the other possibilities. So, for us, um, we're also always really looking for a mix of types of materials. We want there to be things that might be easier, things that might be harder, disciplines that are covered. Um, so for example, Walt Whitman is our first literary collection that we've done, and we'd really love to do more literary materials. We don't really have anything STEM um, at this time. Uh, Claire Barton might get into a little bit with medical history. Um, but we've definitely heard from teachers that that would be great for them to have access to. So um, those are some of the considerations. But to a certain extent, we're also, you know, these things are proposed by um, the divisions that hold them. And so um, it's also it hasn't been so, so fast to build STEAM. Um, yeah, we're still sort of socializing the idea and we're starting to get a lot more proposals in from divisions, but it hasn't been like a flood at first because this is a really new thing for the library. Um, and the divisions do have to be able to commit to a certain level of work on their end um, from their curators who have to work with us to, to get things ready and select the materials and write content um, and then help with the, the reference as well once things are up. Um, I'm pulling up the Abram Lincoln papers, not just because they're cool, but to show you um, what this looks like once we return text. So, We've had about 30,000 pages completed in just under 11 months of this pro program operating, which is a lot. Um, and we've put about 7,000 pages back into um, lock.gov, which is, again, where our digital collections live. So I just did a search for tornado within the Abraham Lincoln papers, and it brought me to um, this letter. I don't think I clicked on the right page, but um, I happen to know that there is writing about a tornado um, in this letter. What's the next page? Um, so this is a page that was transcribed and reviewed by volunteers. And if I click show text, you can actually see that volunteer created text now alongside. So that's what was being pulled, was being indexed to give us the full search. Um, and you can see that there's a credit here transcribed and reviewed by volunteers, which is really important to make sure we're giving them credit and acknowledging their work um, and also letting people know, you know, where this text comes from. Um, you can see we have norms for how to transcribe. So you can see there's still some question marks here of things that were sort of cut off that uh, really no one probably can ever <laughs> figure out what it says. Um, but it probably went through several passes before it was finally signed off on. Um, let's see if we can finally find that tornado reference. This is a really fun uh, letter because it's um, these two brothers writing from a small town on the frontier of Illinois and writing about the crazy weather and wolves and tornadoes and the postmaster, Abraham Lincoln, who just happens to like leave his back door open so they can easily get their mail whenever they want. <laughs> um, 
but uh, yeah, so this is what it looks like when it's back in LSU.gov. Um, and you can also download this here from this page. You can download the text for all the pages um, the same you with the image. Awesome. Just opening it up and seeing if anybody else has any further questions. So we do have a number of people on. So this is um, the lab's biggest project to date. And it's a three year pilot of something that's really likely to become programmatic to the library. So a year in, we're already starting to think about where the permanent home for this program might be. But um, I don't know how much Jamie talked about that, but that's one thing that's really neat about labs is nothing ever, nothing lives permanently in LC labs. It all either needs to find a permanent home and be integrated into what the library you know, supports long term or it gets sunset. Um, so this is gonna be the biggest thing um, to come out of labs that is likely to, you know, get permanent staff attached to it and become a permanent part of the library. So I think just documenting that process is also going to be a really cool part of this experiment. Um, awesome. What about um, for your community members that do you have any, I'm curious, I know I interact with a lot of different technology communities like the forum that you showed. Is there any potential, say, to say, is there documentation about how much work folks have done or what might give them more leverage in that community? Say if someone's documented and edited, you know, if they have an account and you know that they've done this much work, would they become a leader within that community? Or is there any ideas about how to integrate the, the crowd into what you're doing a bit more and whether that's, you know, not exactly a title, but... Um, yeah, them, yeah. Beyond the what you showed. Art. Yeah, we have actually been toying with the idea of sort of an ambassador program because there are um, And this has been shown in uh, most other crowdsourcing projects that um, There are always sort of super users um, Who you know most people will contribute, you know, maybe 50 or 100 pages and then there are people who are just in the thousands There's like a big sort of gap and both are really important um, to you know continuous um, completion of pages, but for those folks who are ambassadors, um, they really, um, they're really active in the forum as well, and they're really interested in how to help other volunteers. Um, they're really oriented toward correctness and, you know, like, how can we help other volunteers, you know, not make this error? Um, and so we take everything that they say and really try to bring it back to the program. This is a user-centered project, and we really take that seriously. Um, but we have been toying with the idea of formalizing that relationship a little bit more and maybe even giving them additional like permissions um, in the project. So that's something we haven't um, completely, you know, uh, solidified yet, but we are thinking about um, that they would, you know, maybe their pages don't have to go through review again um, if they, you know, make edits to something that's already been submitted for review um, because we know that they are really, you know, uh, vested and uh, clear on all the sort of norms and rules. Um, another thing is that we have um, one that the code is on GitHub, so we see actually like feature requests there, but we actually we are really active in turning um, issues that are brought up in the forum into tickets on um, GitHub, and some of those things have actually been, you know, brought into development and completed, um, and then from there we've been able to see actually like changes in the amount of pages that get completed and um, I think it's also really important again to the community to acknowledge them that like we only know how to make this project better by you giving us input on how to do so. Um, so we're really open about that and really active in trying to solicit that feedback from them and also like honoring it when they take the time to give it. Um, so yeah we, we did a big change back in February we were about four months into the project to change the review, the way review was done to actually create like a track so you can keep reviewing um, once you've reviewed one page, which was impossible before you get sort of thrown back to transcription. Um, and we saw one, uh, a, a decrease in sort of the bottleneck of things that were like needing review to completed that ratio. But also that in, you know, the discussion part, they were just like, this is great. We love it. It's like, well, but that's because you suggested that we should do this. Um, so yeah, we, we're trying to make them not just, you know, our volunteers, but that this is an active community that we are in this together, essentially. So, um, yeah. 
Cool. Does anybody else have any questions who's on here? Now's your time. <laughs> Let's see. Is there anything else you'd like to speak about? Um, I mean, there's a lot with this project, but um, I think that, um, yeah, one other thing is that we, um, the, it's not just about the platform, but also about, as you're sort of saying, the engagement side of it and the campaigns that we run and challenges. We've been, we run challenges right now about every three or four months, which are sort of targeted times of activity where we say, hey, can we review this many pages in this month to honor like the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage? And as much as we saw that bottleneck um, go down because we made code changes, it also, we saw a big, you know, jump in review because we did an event around the same time that came right after and that also like sort of leveled us up even another another point um i think it's important to keep reminding people like why we're doing this um and it also um so many people come in and do transcription but review is really the crucial thing to move things to complete it and so giving people a reason to try out this other type of activity um mm -hmm. is really important um and also, you know, give them a chance to give us feedback on that as well. Um, and we've seen this picked up uh, by like what we call affinity groups, which are people with sort of invested interests yeah. in this, like the Red Cross did an internal transcribe-a-thon um, and review that we helped them shape for their staff because that was around Claire Barton, because she's like the founder of the Red Cross. So yeah. it helps them again, connect to their own history and sort of build out their own community um, while also contributing back to this project. So. Um, yeah, we're excited to see where it's going to go. There, we're less than a year in, so there's a lot, a lot of places we could be. We get a lot of questions about audiovisual material, which the Smithsonian's Transcription Center, who we know well and work closely with, they just launched AV transcription a few months ago, so we're watching that to see how that goes. Um, we get a lot of questions about, you know, with the forum that we had last week, how this could integrate with machine learning. We heard a lot there about applying machine learning to collections and then essentially looking to the crowd to be sort of the human eye um, for QA to, because, you know, the, the machine learning algorithms for the most part aren't, aren't all the way there yet. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that this is just sort of the very beginning <laughs> here at the library, but um, yeah, we're just trying to, to document and um, try things out and keep growing, so. Excellent. Well, we had some people log off. <laughs> okay, I know that we are running time, so, um, so yeah, I think, and Jamie had to run off, but we're both happy to take questions, you know, afterward, and um, we're really glad that you invited us to, to do this. Yeah, this it was it was so great to have you guys, and we really, I think the community who was on here, all I heard about was positive feedback, so it was really good to have you, Lauren, and Jamie on. And I guess with that, if there's no more questions, then we've got Allison on here, and I think that's it now. If you don't have any questions, Allison, we'll log off and end the, end the conversation. As I said, this will get posted to, it goes on to YouTube, because that's the best way to share with the broadest audience for us. Um, and, but it is Creative Commons license when I do upload it there. So Great. Continue that Thanks. tradition of what you guys are doing. Allison says, nope, but great job. This was fascinating. Thanks so much. Yeah. Cool. Right. Awesome. Nice to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> Thanks for everything. We'll stay in touch. Yeah. And okay. um, if you have any links you want to share or anything, feel free to email me after and I'll share them with the group. Great. All right. Bye, Lauren. <laughs> have a good night, everyone.